Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this lecture in our Distinguished Visiting Professor series, and the first to be held in hybrid mode after several years living with the impact of COVID-19. I am Bruce McFarlane, the Dean of the Faculty of Education and Human Development at the Education University of Hong Kong. Welcome, everybody. Tonight, it's my honor and great pleasure to welcome Ronald Barnett, Emeritus Professor of Higher Education at UCL Institute of Education in London, where he was also Dean of Professional Development and later Pro-Director of Long-Term Strategy. For a long time now, Ronald Barnett has been one of the world's leading professors of higher education. His immense influence has been felt by several generations of scholars of higher education and philosophy. He has received numerous awards and honors and was special advisor to the UK's Select Committee on Higher Education, which produced the Deering Report in 1997. He is also the founding president of the Philosophy and Theory of Higher Education Society. Since 1990, on the publication of The Idea of Higher Education, a work based on his own doctoral thesis, he has given us a pra a practically a library book stack of around 35 monographs, many of which have been translated into other languages. He has also written more than 150 papers and his publications have attracted over 25,000 citations. These metrics are one way of explaining the impact of Professor Barnett's work, but there is much that the data does not tell us. I can tell you that Ronald Barnett is probably the most influential thinker about higher education of the modern age. Through his persuasive books and articles, Professor Barnett has pioneered a new subfield, the philosophy of higher education. His work is both deeply informed by the past and forward-looking, bringing together a disparate canon of writing about higher education over several centuries. This draws on both well-known and half-forgotten philosophers. At the same time, he's given us lots of new ways of thinking about universities and higher education critical being, super complexity, the will to learn, and most recently, the ecological university as a feasible utopia. As a writer, teacher, and supervisor, Professor Barnett is both challenging and encouraging in equal measure. He is not just a great writer and thinker about higher education, but a great supervisor too. I am one of many who has had the privilege of being his doctoral student and I'm proud of having been barnetized in the process. To me, being barnetized means developing a lifelong commitment to interrogating our assumptions about universities and higher education, and constantly searching for new interpretations and ways of understanding. This is the Ron Barnett way. He has planted a seed of learning in the minds of many people and has worked incredibly hard to nurture these plants, including myself, during his career. Professor Barnett has an immense legacy as a scholar of higher education, and we are very privileged to have him here as the first of our faculty's distinguished visiting professors to visit the campus. So please welcome Professor Ronald Barnett. Thank you, everybody. Um, and before we hear from Professor Barnett, I will hand over to Professor and Anatoly Alexienko, who will introduce our discussion panel and explain the way in which those online and in the live audience can post questions. So over to you, Anatoly. Chair the lecture by our distinguished visiting professor, Ronald Barnett. Professor Barnett will present uh, his idea of ecological university shortly. After his talk, I will in invite for discussion our esteemed scholars of higher education from Hong Kong, whose numerous publications shed light on amazing transformations of academic profession in Asia. Uh, Associate Professor Tina Gaofan and Assistant Professors uh, Ji Sun Jian from University of Hong Kong and uh, Pius Tan uh, from Education University of Hong Kong will reflect on the feasibility of Professor Bonnet's a utopia of ecological university. At the same time, I would like to encourage all of you to use the link to the Google form, which is accessible either through the 
QR code, which you have received at uh, the entrance, or through the chat room in the Zoom. You are invited to send uh, us your uh, comments and questions. Please mention your name and affiliation. So you can do it during or after the presentation. If you are online, please keep your microphones on mute and share your thoughts in the chat room. I will be happy to facilitate the Q&A session after a discussion by Drs. Um, Gao, uh, Tan, and Jan. And now, please welcome Professor Ronald Barnett. That all right? Yes, now far away. Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, um, Anatoly and uh, and um, um, Professor McFarlane, uh, for introducing me and uh, for welcoming me. It's a great privilege and honor to be here today um, to share some of my thoughts with you. Um, I've been privileged to give a number, a couple of talks already over the the week, um, and I've tried to be fairly interactive, but I've uh, been put under orders to provide a, a fairly formal uh, lecture today. So I hope you'll bear with me, uh, those of you who have seen my more interactive style, uh, and we can have some questions and answers uh, later. Um, I'm going to speak for about 40 minutes, and I will have uh, instructions again coming at me so that I don't uh, speak for too long uh, and uh, and take up too much time. But I'm going to uh, try and use the time to, to make progress. Um, let me just say, get straight into it, because I do want to try and say a few things. My talk is, as you've heard, about uh, the ecological university, um, and I want, therefore, to touch on the themes of ecology and sustainability and what it is to be a university in the 21st century. I'm concerned that universities are falling short of their possibilities, and I also want to suggest they have responsibilities. So those two terms, responsibilities and possibilities, are going to be key in what I have to say. I'm coming at you as a, a social philosopher with a practical intent. I'm interested in how we use ideas to help us move forward in this very difficult and challenging world. My idea of philosophy is realist, it's social, it's critical, it's imaginative, and it's environmental, but in its fullest sense. And I'll say a little bit more about that. And when I say it's a philosophy with a social intent. I mean, I am actually looking to the university and higher education to help to form a better world, better, better than the one we're in at the moment. My argument is really, in, in a way, quite simple. It's got three steps to it. In the first part of my talk, I'm going to be introducing the ideas of complexity and what I'm calling super complexity. And in the second half of my talk, I'm going to describe how I see the university as set in interaction with a number of ecosystems and I identify eight ecosystems. And then in the last part of my talk, the third part, I'm going to try and bring those two parts together the one about complexity and super complexity on the one hand, and the other about the university as an ecological form on the other. And I'm going to try and say a few words about what it is to realize the university in that dual ecological setting. So that's where I'm going. Let's get going. And I'm going to move fairly briskly, if you don't mind. Moving to just see. Yeah, okay, fine. We're we're okay. I think we're we're in business. Yes. 
fine. Good. So, an age of complexity. What do I mean by complexity? Just think of the COVID crisis. We were surrounded by viruses, epidemics, at least one epidemic, possibly more than one, human bodies and their reactions, animals, possibly, economics, transport systems, health systems, medical systems, scientific systems, world of knowledge production, cultures, all of those elements were scudding around, interacting with each other. It was a complex system in the formal sense of complexity. Complexity is a, a, a number of elements bumping into each other, which produce emergence, which produce unforeseen further um, effervescences from, a, from a, a situation that's in front of us. Unforeseen outcomes. That's complexity. Re and it's real. It's, it's major. It has effects on the, on the world, on, on life, on human beings. Complexity. And that's where our focus was while we were combating uh, the COVID crisis all around the world. But in addition to complexity, there was lurking underneath although we didn't notice it so much, there was what I call super complexity. Super complexity is that form of complexity which is concerned with ideas and beliefs. We had lurking there, not so much visible, visibly in the public domain, but really there anyway, issues about human rights, social obligations, freedom and liberty, the relationship between persons and the state. These are issues of beliefs, of ideas, of perceptions, of frameworks, much more intractable in, and fuzzy in a way than even the issues of complexity that I've just touched on. And we rather lost sight of them or didn't want to engage with them, except in a very crude way. So. In England, we have politicians saying we've had too much of experts. In other words, we don't want to worry ourselves about the really difficult issues of the day. So complexity and super complexity. How might we compare these two? They're fundamentally different, but they're interacting. Given enough time and resource, we will be able to mitigate, soften, the challenges of complexity. If we had enough resource, if we had enough time, we could do something about the worst aspects of complexity. We could begin to, as it were, untangle the spaghetti strands. But super complexity is fundamentally different because the more we go on worrying about issues of human rights, of freedom, and all of those other intractable ideas and issues that I mentioned, far from easing, they get more complicated because more and more ideas and issues start emerging out of the conceptual woodwork. They are intractable problems to which there is never any fundamental resolution. Should mask be worn or not? Should vaccine vaccines be mandatory? Should I obey the state or not? And so on and so forth. And the more we ask those questions, the more other questions of that ilk unfold in front of us. What is it ultimately to be a human being in this crazy world? To have a mind even? These are intractable questions. They are questions not just of extraordinary situations like university seminars, but they are issues that we are dealing with every day of our lives, whether we confront them directly or not. And both of these, complexity and super complexity, bedevil higher education and universities. Universities are swimming in this ether of complexity and super complexity all the time. We know that they're 
involved in systems on a continuing basis, systems which are disturbing and making life uncomfortable for universities in many ways, not only for the top brass, for the leaders, but for all of us, for students, for lecturers, national systems of audit, of finance, of regulations, global issues of rankings, of competition. There are complex systems here that universities are having to move in and out of all the time. And they pr produce unpredictability and uncertainty. And we're having to live with all of that. The university is having to live with that, all of that. What is it to be an international student? An international student is having to move in and out of all of these complex systems all the time. State may change its, its regulations, its visa requirements and so on and so forth. We're having to live with complex systems all the time. But super complexity itself is also lurking there. A little under the surface perhaps, but it's there all the time. What are the responsibilities of the university in the 21st century? Where might they go? Where should they go? Are there to be any universal principles that should govern the university in the 21st century? What are the responsibilities? What are the allegiances of the university to be? To knowledge and truth? To the state? To society? To students? To nature? In what direction might a university go? There's no straightforward answer to these questions. Universities have to confront them all the time, all across the world. And here's a favorite of mine. What is higher education? What is higher about higher education? Is higher education simply another step on the education ladder, so to speak? Or is there something particular, or should there be something particular about higher education that makes it higher? Is it just the acquisition of skills or is it something else? Is it something to do with the development of students' humanity? Are we allowed to ask that question today? There's a lot to talk about engagement with the world, engagement with society. What, what might engagement mean? These are fuzzy questions, difficult questions, intractable questions. We're told the university should engage with society could have impact on society, but what kind of impact? And what is that relationship to be? Are we simply to give society what it's asking of us, what it says it needs from us? Or can we, should we also give to society what it doesn't want? So these are tricky questions that are in front of us. The challenges of super complexity go on and on. So what are the implications of these opening reflections on complexity? Well, matters of complexity are complex, but they can be addressed, I'm su suggesting. We can have a go at them, and universities have developed techniques and strategies to deal with them. But the matters of super complexity, I'm saying, are perennial and get more and more difficult and intractable all the time. Inevitably, as universities become more and more global, engage with each other, engage with the world, and as higher education becomes literally a geopolitical issue right across the world, so difficulties are of a super complex kind of ideas, of beliefs and values come at us in pretty large force. And so universities have to tackle not only systems complexity, but they should also be tackling issues of super complexity. But my argument here is that universities have focused their attention on matters of complexity and have neglected matters of super complexity. They are put in the too difficult box. Let us not have any 
Let's not waste time wor worrying about academic freedom and issues of that, uh, of that nature. Let us just cope with the matter in, in matters in hand. The matters of supercomplexity are just better avoided. And what does this mean in turn? It means that university corporate strategies, and you've heard that I've been around the block a few times and wore most of the T-shirts, designed a corporate strategy myself. It's all too easy for the corporate strategies to become unduly limited because they focus on issues of complexity. They focus on systems and structures and financing and regulations. But they're less likely to get involved in matters of value, the difficult matters of super complexity, of being human, of concern for the world, of the well being of its own people. And when they do touch on these matters, and they do from time to time, they turn them into matters of complexity. So human beings are now called in universities, human resources, and they become entities to be moved around and charted and monitored. So the, the tricky issues become simply matters of systems. Well, I'm sure none of that applies here uh, to universities in Hong Kong, where you're much more enlightened than others, but it happens around the world as universities become corporations. So just a quick set of uh, thoughts about implications for research and teaching. For research, what are the implications for this? Where's, where are we getting to against this context? Well, we know where it's going. Universities all across the world are trying to boost their research profiles and they look at their performance on the world rankings and they look at the data, the collection of papers and the world leading journals colleagues are supposed to be having their papers published in. We're, we're dominated by systems and it's systems on systems and they go on and on. Um, even in the introduction that Bruce was so generous to give me, hear a little about it, bit about you know the profile coming through all the time. So, what is to count as research? What counts as research is STEM, and so research itself is skewed because that's where the numbers count. That's where the income is to be derived. And so scholarship becomes tainted, becomes skewed itself. And the value to society of research, the potential value is narrowed as a result. And research itself, I'd want to say, actually focuses largely on matters of complexity, of of bits and pieces in the world, whether it's human bodies or modeling or whatever it is, we're, it's, we're unduly now focused on how the world fits together or doesn't fit together. And scholarly work, which raises these difficult issues of value and belief and possibilities becomes disparaged. So, Research focuses on matters uh, crudely of complexity rather than of super complexity. And what does it mean for teaching and learning? This focus on complexity and the neglect of super complexity. You see again that teaching and learning is reduced to matters of student throughput, of skills, employability. Graduate premium, as we call it in England, how much more are you going to earn through your lifetime as a result of being a student? As if that is what counts. 
turn, whether you're a better human being and what that might mean. We've got a phrase in England now, work readiness. That's what counts, that you're ready for the labour market. So what is teaching or what is learning? We don't dare ask these questions anymore because they're, they're in, again, in the too difficult box. Teaching just becomes simply a matter of ensuring that students acquire skills. And so we have in England the, a domination of teaching programs by what are called learning outcomes. So for every program of study, there should be a whole set of verb-oriented learning outcomes. So we're skewing education, we're skewing research, we're skewing the design of universities in favour of complexity rather than super complexity, the difficult issues of the day. So all of this is, of course, taking place against a context. It doesn't just happen. And I want then now to learn, go on to the second part of my talk and start talking about the context and unraveling that a bit. But what is the context? As I say, universities have developed systems, strategies, techniques, to cope with a difficult and changing world. And I don't know to what extent you've come across these management techniques of environment scanning, of producing scenarios, you call in the experts and consultants, you pay them lots of dollars and pounds. You get them to imagine scenarios. Mostly they're dominated by information technology. Foresight planning, and even talk of designing universities. I don't want to disparage all of that, but there's very little real imagination and very little teasing out of fundamental issues, problem issues, difficult issues. So all of that simply doesn't go far enough in my view. So I want to press uh, the whole idea of the context under which and in which universities are placed today. And I want to suggest that universities are not just bumping into difficult systems in the world, but we can talk, we can begin to form a vocabulary for getting uh, on top of, or at least aware of, the nature of the systems that universities are bumping into, whether they like it or not. And I want to identify eight big systems in the world. Knowledge, learning, persons, social institutions, the economy, polity, culture, and the natural environment or nature. So there's, for me, these eight big systems that there are in the world, and the universities are butting onto them, overlapping them, they are overlapping the university. And so we get something like this. It's a bit hazy, it's a bit fuzzy, but that's my drawing for you. I'm, I'm technologically challenged, you understand. But hopefully you can see enough of that. You've got a university which is encircled by these eight systems. You can see the hazy lines. They're hazy. They're like cloud formations. They're moving around. No definite boundaries. They're all bumming into each other. They're interacting with the university. The university is interacting with these systems. Fuzzy lines, fluid boundaries. They're all in motion. Everything is in motion. The university is in motion as it's bumping into, overlapping, and encircled by these systems. The, and the lines of force go both ways, notice. It's not just that there's a horrible world out there imposing itself on the university. I'm suggesting in this diagram that the university has possibilities in relation to the eight systems in and around it.
And I want to suggest that it's helpful if we call these systems ecosystems. So what do I mean by an ecosystem? I want to say that each one of those systems is a unity, it's more or less a unity. We can talk about the knowledge ecosystems. We can talk about culture as an ecosystem. Each one has a unity more or less of its own, even though fuzzy. And each one I want to suggest is also of inherent value. So knowledge is a value, culture is a value, each person is a value. The economy is a value, nature is a value. And there is a sense of stability to each one that we can go on talking about culture, we can go on talking about knowledge over the centuries, uh, over eons of time, perhaps. So there's a tendency to self-reproduction, even though they're changing and moving. We can recognize one against another, but they also have a fragility. Each one is fragile. And we know this in, in nature. We see this in nature, how it's fragile, massive ecosystem, and the ecosystems in nature are fragile, but so too are all of the others. I haven't got time to work through them all today. Um, I, have, I wrote this book, The Ecological University, came out in 2018. I'm working now on a sequel to this book uh, called Realising the Ecological University, and in it I'm working through each of those eight systems, one by one. I haven't got time to do all of that today. But I want to say, as I say, that each one is fragile. Each one is impaired. So each one is affected by all the others, fragility, impairments. But the last point, those impairments acquire a emerge naturally, but they also have emerged over the last two to three hundred years as a result of human action. They haven't just occurred naturally. They've occurred partly because of the way we've gone about understanding the world and imposing ourselves on the world. And we have impaired each one of those systems. So I want to say that all of those six conditions are present. Yes, in nature, which is one of those, the natural environment, call it nature. But they are also present in all of those uh, eight ecosystems, all of my conditions. And I want to say that the university is implicated in all of this in a profound set of ways. As I've been saying, the university has these big ecosystems moving in and out of it all the time. Whether it realizes it or not, they're there. Whether it's got a language for understanding this situation. Each university, too, it follows from, what, from the diagram, and hence the fuzziness of the dotted line around the university has its own profile across those ecosystems. It's, and therefore, it has its own possibilities in relation to that ecological environment, as I'm calling it. it, has its own possibilities, even though it's a moving set of targets, a moving, a, a moving setting and situation. So what does it mean to design a university strategy against this set of considerations, it means that the university strategy can never be fixed, always has to go on being redesigned. But it also follows from what I've been saying, it's not just a matter of a nice quick fix or a technological fix. The redesign has to keep addressing these co super complex issues of freedom, of, of what it is to be a person, a human being, of our relationships with nature, and so on and so forth. They have to always, the big issues, the difficult issues, have to be continually kept in front of us under review. But it also follows from what I've been saying that none of those ecosystems is to be 
privileged, neither the economy, and we've been beset by the economy for the last 20, 30 years, nor even nature, as some of the ecologists would like to say. No, we've got to take all eight on board together. None of them is privileged. So we've got to move at different levels in all sorts of directions all at once if we're serious about repositioning the university in the 21st century. We've got to also think about not only our possibilities now, but our responsibilities. If we are in part, partly culpable for this, the impairments of the ecosystems, we have to think about the resources we have, the capabilities we have, the powers we have in order to begin to mitigate or to repair the impairments of those ecosystems. But as I say, it's not just a matter of technological effects and design, but it's a matter of living with super complexity and all of the difficulties that flow from that. Just quickly on sustainability, it follows from what I've been saying, that we've got to be very wary of the term sustainability, because it's not as if there is a nice world out there to be sustained. First of all, the world is impaired. We need to think about how it is impaired and how we might come into a better set of relationships. It's a malfunctioning world, a world that's falling short of its possibilities. So we've got to think about our possibilities in helping to repair uh, a situation that is impaired. It's a world that's not just out there that we should be sustaining, but it's in us, it's in the university, it's come into us. We need to think about how it is inside us now and how we're going to respond in that way. I've been saying that each university has its own ecological profile across those ecosystems. So each university can't rely on a, on a universal blueprint. It's got to do the hard thinking, the hard design, the hard work, going on and on and on, never finished. Always working out, seeing its possibilities, and that's problematic. And here we come to a little aphorism of mine, a distinction between management and leadership. I say if management is the art of the possible, dealing with complexity. Leadership is the art of the impossible, dealing with super complexity. And that is much more challenging. It's challenging enough, it is challenging, to be a good manager. It's even more challenging to be a good leader because you're dealing with ideas. You're not just dealing with ideas. You're not just hiving yourself off in your rector's office and having a nice sort of talk to yourself. You're engaging with the university. You're helping it to engage with complex ideas. You're raising big and complex issues and you're letting them come up through the body of the university. For example, a lot of talk these days about the public good and universities serving the public good. What does that mean? Let's have a debate about that in the university. Let's hear the different ideas about what the public good is. What are our possibilities? What are our responsibilities? These all have to be worked through continuously. But I've been saying it is a complex, complex world. And some universities have been noticing some of this, of course. All around the world, you will find, frankly, enlightened leaders who are doing some of this. Uh, they even buy, would you believe, some of Ron Barnett's books from time to time. It is a complex world, a difficult and challenging world, and these systems are intertwined. But I'm saying that these super complex issues are all too easily put into the not today box. Uh, I've got enough to do on my plate just getting through the day, getting through the week. You know, another document arrives from the Minister of Higher Education. Another document arrives from the, the government authority responsible for audit and so on and so forth. Complexity takes over if we're not careful. Let me just work through, just as an example, a little bit. One of those 
systems, learning, works at different levels. As I say, in England, and I'm afraid we exported it, and people took too much notice of England, we exported it to, much to the world, the idea of learning outcomes. Carving up a, a curriculum in terms of verb-oriented, uh, performance-oriented outcomes. What is it to learn? What is it to be educated? These questions really seldom ask. But I want to say that against the background that I've been sketching out, learning has to be fundamentally re-understood, completely re-understood. What is it to learn? Students are incredibly complex themselves, each one. Each one has his or her own learning ecology. They have their own lives. We forget about that. Own lives outside the campus. Wheeling and dealing, often working with families, perhaps in work, all sorts of interests. They have their own learning ecology. How does this learning relate to that learning? It's called life-wide learning. What are our responsibilities? We have to give students, it seems to me, the human wherewithal to live, to thrive, to be in this crazy world, to contribute to it. And they are. The students are very often ahead of us. But that seems to me part of the challenge. Forget about learning outcomes. Forget about employability. Of course, I exaggerate. But we've got to be prepared to say these things. And that means teaching has to be completely reth rethought. As I was saying, with a smile on my face, I don't think I've ever taught. I'm not going to teach. It's not my job to teach. It's my job to provoke, to irritate, to annoy, to, to inspire, to, yes, to set you off, to, to give you new energy, to keep you learning, to keep you questioning. I'm not here to teach you anything. My job is to help you cope with this crazy world, not just to cope with complexity, not even to cope with super complexity, but to begin to be able to put new ideas into the world, to go on making the super complex even more complex. And so we turn to learning in an even bigger sense, learning beyond the university. Is this a learning society? Is society learning? Is the world learning? And what are the universities doing to help society learn and the world learn? Are adults learning? In England, 20% of adults are functionally illiterate. What are our responsibilities towards society when there are such disparate levels of learning and capability in society? What, how, are we, how are we helping society to engage with intractable questions and problems in the world? How do we account for populism in the West, for Brexit? We have to understand it as an impoverished set of learning systems. And what then are our responsibilities as universities towards learning in that wider sense, towards the learning ecosystem? What are we doing to advance public reason? But what are we doing also for the voiceless, for those who are unable to express a voice? What are we doing for the glaciers, for the rhinos? Who speaks for them? These are very big issues that this ecosystem perspective is opening up, I think. And so almost You'll glad, be glad to know coming to the end, pushing this idea of how we cope with all of this. And for me, a big concept is that of transdisciplinarity. And we haven't, we hear the idea these days. It used to be multidisciplinarity and then interdisciplinarity. We've got to ditch those. Why? Because multidisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity, complex as they are, and they are, they are the outcomes of the interests, the knowledge interests of the academic community. In place of that, we have to insert and make a lot, bring alive transdisciplinarity, which is, as the name implies, it's a trans notion. 
coming into hopefully our learning institutions, our universities, which starts not from our knowledge interests, our human interests, but from the interests of the world. And that is a fundamentally different order of being for the university. We start from the way the world is. The climate is warming, so we do something about it. But that means orienting ourselves, and it means engaging all of our knowledge efforts in the interests of the world, not in our interests. The world is interconnected, as I've been saying it is. Then somehow or other, we've got to connect our knowledge efforts, but not just to focus on their own knowledge problems, but to focus on the challenges of complexity and super complexity that there are in the world. And to put it formally, this means that ontology and epistemology have to come together. And I want to say that ontology is prior. How is the world? What is the state of the world? Let's start from there and, jo in, and join our knowledge efforts to the world rather than the other way around, hoping that the world will fit to our interests. The fate of the world, I want to suggest, depends in part on our developing new forms of knowledge in our universities, which we can call transdisciplinary. And so to my sets of conclusions, you remember I've given you, as it were, two sets of ideas, one around complexity and super complexity, and the other around the university engaging with and involved with uh, multiple ecosystems. And I've been saying that they need to come together. We need to be thinking about the design and development of our universities by bringing these together. It can't be done as a quick fix. We've got to move at different levels in all sorts of different directions all at once. Who, who said this was easy? It's not easy. Very large implications, I think, flow from what I've been suggesting to you. Each university will have its own ecological profile. What does that mean? It means in part, it has its own responsibilities because it will be involved in the world in different ways and it will have its own possibilities and they have to be discerned. They can't be easily identified. We've got to put on our imaginative, now our poetic hats and do a little bit of dreaming. What are our possibilities? What are our responsibilities? And to discern them imaginatively in the world in order that we can start to do our bit to repair the world, not just sustain it. There is no blueprint for any of this. We've got to engage with each other, engage as collectives in our universities and across our universities. And I've been talking about the learning ecosystem purely as one example, but you'll have sensed that it engages with, interacts with other ecosystems. And so this work has to go on in difficult, delicate ways across all of the ecosystems. This is an incredibly difficult matter. We, and it has implications, I've been saying, for leadership in our universities. We need different ideas about what leadership is. But then who said any of this was easy? Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you. Thank you very much for your fascinating talk. Now we have a panel of discussants and we have a little bit of time. It's around, I guess, uh, 40 minutes. So we will... Uh, hear discussions and then uh, also uh, invite your questions and comments. I can see one hand going up, but also please you use your uh, QR code and and also type in there if we don't reach uh, to you with this microphone. Thank you. So, um, colleagues, oh, where we begin. Yes. Well, thank you so much for Professor Barnett's inspiring talk. As always, uh, this is such a privilege to make a dialogue with you. Um, I just wanted to share some thought from his lecture. First of all, I sincerely, deeply, deeply agree with uh, Professor Barnett's 
reflection on today's uh, universities and higher education regarding super complexity, uncertainty, and multiple interpretations of the university's role. Uh, there is no single set of ideas that constitutes the essence of the university today. I also agree that most stakeholders in higher education tend to focus on solving the problems at the very superficial and structural level uh, instead of discussing the fundamental issues. So I just to take an example from my own research area, which uh, focuses on employment and labor market transition among university graduates. So my argument from my research is that the whole concept of concept of value of the work, jobs, or learning uh, will be changed, especially in this generation of students, particularly with the technology development and we say like automation in economic terms. However, current discourses in higher education are all about improving employability, which has an assumption that, first of all, all the graduate students uh, want decent jobs, decent jobs defined by us. And the second assumption is like, if we train them better, they can get better jobs, uh, again, defined by us. But the idea might not work in the future, graduates or students, because all the students in this generation, they define the decent jobs very differently. And also they might compete, actually work ready graduates, they might compete for the lack of job opportunities at the end. So in that kind of sense, uh, I agree with that kind of necessity of discussing more fundamental issues than simply saying we need to train them better. So having, having said that, I also really agree with this idea of ecological university that Professor Barnett proposed, particularly the idea that universities need to be more responsible, uh, socially engaged, and authentic in the coming super complex ages. Well, I just had a bit of struggle to consider thinking about responsibility because who defines the scope of responsibility in today's universities? And my bigger concern would be, what if the responsibility is defined in the wrong direction by leaders or managers? Because we see so many misconceptions and misuses of social responsibility of universities across histories, uh, politics, and social context. So what if some intellectuals or authorities use the responsibility for their own ideology? That was my bigger concern. And if that happens, can we only rely on these individual academics, intellectual integrity, integrity to decide which values and responsibilities are more important than others? What kind of collective effort can we make as a university? Uh, I tried to find the answer by reading Barnett's works a bit further. And then I found a bit of a clue in his text. So I just quote them uh, uh, to conclude my discussion. The ecological university does not directly serve the world. It does not simply serve the interest of the world as defined by the world, but it contributes to the definition of the interest of the world. Yeah, thank you very much. Please allow me to keep my mask on because <laughs> I just recovered from COVID. Um, thanks, Professor Barnett, for this very short, working, wonderful presentation. Uh, and I'm very honored, pleased, uh, being part of today's discussion panel. For me, as a sociologist interested in education, equity, and diversity, and your presentation acts as a catalyst for constructive dialogue in the current context of massification of higher education on the one hand, and on the other, the resurgence of aggressive xenophobia and the fearful hostility towards minoritized. Please allow me to use minority students, a majority of whom hail from the neighboring South and Southeast Asian countries as an example. 
According to the population, the latest population census in 2021, about 50% of minority youth aged 19 to 24 got access to local higher education. When compared with around 55.8% for the whole population. So the first glance, the figure looks really good, right? If we ignore the fact that many minority secondary school graduates culminate in self-financing diploma and sub-degree programs. But little is known about those minority students who have got into universities and colleges. How about their psychological adjustment, their academic persistence and the success on university campuses? One, the job rate has not yet been collected. The empirical research conducted by us reviewed the paucity of campus diversity and their lesser sense of belonging to the university community. We know we are all under the new liberal philosophy. So the increased international student mobility and higher education internationalization will continuously compound, compound our universities today. So it's complexity, super complexity. Professor Bennett highlights the contribution of higher education to better futures for all. So this draws our attention to how higher education institutions in the contemporary context can create and develop the campus climate conducive to the health and the personal growth for all students. Thank you. So thank you, uh, Professor Barnett, for giving us very stimulating and very creative lecture. I think the lecture is very creative, uh, not only that in the last one hour, we had our heads immersed in the air of Barnett's philosophy, which is original and very creative. Professor Barnett also created the time and space for us to slow down from a lot of busyness and even anxiety. I really received the energy from you to uh, become optimistic again about uh, the function and the, yeah, uh, uh, good purposes of uh, the university. And this is a very good time for us to, to reflect upon our academic life and our future. So I appreciate a lot the lecture stimulate us to, to think, to understand the world, uh, which is complex, super complex, and also crazy and difficult. I love these two words, crazy and difficult. But still, uh, we want to reconsider the world's institution called the university. So today we are especially invited uh, to think about responsibilities and possibilities of the university alongside uh, how we understand the world, which is highly uh, ecological, interconnected. So I appreciate a lot uh, the invention creation by uh, Professor Barnes on uh, the ecological university. And in that, uh, we understand uh, the university has its own agency and it is an active variable uh, in the world comprising ec ecosystems. However, what I observe is in, in different contexts of a university with its own uh, ecological life. However, there are other outer uh, empirical variables which determine real life of academic leaders and also common academics. And those kind of external variables also affect our optimism and pessimism. Uh, for example, different nations, different types of university, different academic disciplines have different understandings about what is meant by the university and also uh, the quality, how we understand quantity and the speed, the fast speed, how, how fast and how uh, possible we can be slow in producing our work. So my question for Professor Barnett is about the relationship between philosophy of ed higher education and uh, empirical scholarship in higher education studies. Because I see uh, we have a lot of young scholars and doctoral students here. Can you share with us some thoughts about uh, using the philosophy of higher education in designing vigorous uh, empirical scholarship 
in higher education studies, especially for realizing the ecological university. And my second question is about the topic of today's lecture, realizing the ecological university. And I am also very happy to know you are going to write another book on that. Uh, can you share with us uh, more about uh, how you understand realizing what realizing is and what it is not? How do we know we are realizing the ecological university, but not going the other way or even opposite way? Um, does empirical research help us to know better? And like what Jason has suggested, uh, who are to uh, realize it uh, individually and collectively? And I'm very interested uh, on the role of higher education thinkers and researchers. Do we have special role to initiate the debates and the engagement of ideas uh, while we are living in a busy and crazy world, including university? So thanks again, uh, Professor Barnett, for this wonderful lecture. Uh, and I get very enlightened uh, to go beyond my imaginations, uh, which is my research topic that is on academic entrepreneurialism. So thank you very much. Professor Barnett, would you like to respond to the comments? Right. Well, gosh, uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, a lot of thoughts and ideas there. Um, which uh, you know, I'm very happy to just, in a way, leave as contributions to the conversation. Um, um, there, there were so many there, but uh, I just pick up one or two um, it quickly, um, uh, which interests me particularly, this whole notion of work readiness, of going into the labour market, of, of work itself. Um, uh, and it, it seems to me that, that precisely is a is a nice area where we need to be raising uh, difficult issues as to what it is to be, as it were, ready for work, um, and what work is, um, and what it means to be skillful in relation to work. Um, and it seems to me we're simply not being serious about that set of questions. In other words, you don't even have to start raising fancy philosophical issues about global citizenship or public good. Park those to one side. Just ask, well, what is work? What is it to most, many of our students who are with us today, undergraduates in higher education will be alive in the next century. Just think about it. What are their lives going to be like? What transformations, what transitions are they going to see? But then, what transitions and transformations are they going to help to develop themselves? I like examples. Imagine you're a, a ward sister in a, or nurse in a hospital and you see something going wrong. Is it being picked up? Is it being noticed? Are we giving our graduates the capacity, the wherewithal, the cogn cognitive wherewithal, the values wherewithal, the being wherewithal to cope with that sort of situation, to bring it to the attention of supervisors who would rather not know about it, to bring it to the attention of the authorities who don't want to be disturbed? We have a phrase in England called whistleblowing. I don't know whether you have an exact translation. But are we enabling our students in higher education who are going to go into very often profoundly important professions? Even if you're, you're an architect, you're an engineer, profoundly important uh, professions and situations to become whistleblowers. In other words, to become critical beings of the way they are in work. So this whole notion of being ready for work is to me of fundamental importance and significance and is another area where we need to be asking uh, these difficult questions. And yes, students fail. I failed all my exams at school and at university over and over. 
Now, we don't need to go quite into the detail of all of that as to why and how that happened, but it raises nice issues as to what we're doing in higher education. Why do students commit suicide? I'm sure they don't in China, but I'm afraid they do in England. What's going on here? We're losing students rather than building them up, encouraging them, giving them that wherewithal for this extraordinary world. We're losing them. So this whole notion of what it is to be a student is, again, of profound importance. And then the relationship between the th theorists and the, wool and the woolly philosophers on the one hand and the empirical researchers on the other. It's fundamental. I'm a great admirer of the 1930s school of critical theory that went from Germany to, to, uh, to, to, to America. Um, and they were philosophers, but they were empirically minded philosophers. And they themselves did front rank empirical work. And I hope you feel that what I'm saying, what I'm writing about, has, in the words of Deleuze and Guattari, it has empirical warrant. And if you spot anything that I'm saying, is it fundamentally at odds with what the empirical stories are saying? I want to know, because I'm reading a lot of that literature. I even get a lot of it to review, and I'm trying to keep in step with it so far as I can. So this relationship between theory and the way the world is is of fundamental importance to me. Uh, has to be, given the way I'm presenting my philosophy, as I'm saying, it's hopefully it's very much rooted in the way the world is. So we need to roll out our sleeves uh, and try to get to grips with all of that uh, nitty grittiness of the world. Um, so there's all of that. But then how do we go forward from here? The last one. Um, what is it to realize the university? Well, I, I, this idea of transdisciplinarity is now coming back into the literature. It's first to be seen in the literature in the early 1970s, by the way, and we lost sight of it. It's now coming back. And there's an abstruse literature, which I don't understand. It's too much for me, uh, on uh, this notion of transdisciplinarity. What does it mean? How do we get hold of it in a university? From time to time, you see, you see really great leaders of universities picking up some of these ideas. In the 1960s in England, we tried to institute new universities which were founded on interdisciplinary lines. The trouble is that the disciplines assert themselves. They keep asserting themselves. And all these grand ideas about trying to bring people together. Founder, when I was a dean, I had great fun in bringing people together, lunchtime conversations. And you see the body language as you bring the sociologists and the philosophers together, you know, and they won't even look at each other, let alone talk to each other. We, we, we have universities that ill fit for their purposes and their responsibilities in this, in this world. So that's one issue. But another follows from what I've been saying, and some leaders, some leaders of universities around the world, you see, are doing this in a remarkable way of lifting the university as a collective space of conversation, but not only just nice, comfortable conversation. No, they're actually trying to release and make public, as it were, the conflicts, the difficulties, the different points of view that there are. We have big issues now in universities around the world, which very often leaders would rather hide and suppress, but others allowing them to come out and having difficult conversations about trans issues, about academic freedom. Do we have a right to shout speakers down and all of that kind of thing? Who has the right to have a voice, to be heard? What are the limits of all of that? We need to be having conversations about this sort of thing. And you see the great leaders of some universities having the courage to allow those debates uh, to go forward. In the philosophical literature, we see words like 
conversation, another one coming into the language is gathering. These are all nice, but they're too, they're too comfortable for me. We've got to have difficult, almost antagonistic conversations. We've got to be able to, in a phrase I like, to disagree well, to have a conflict over ideas and not to rubbish people as people, but to be concerned with their ideas and let the ideas flow. So that is another big issue about what leadership really is and how we can begin to open our universities as spaces of ferment of ideas. But it means also, as I was saying, to open up a university where you get these difficult issues addressing, uh, are being addressed by the whole university. So when I was a pro-director designing the corporate strategy, I didn't just sit in my office and words on the screen, which I did, but I tested them with the whole university. And I had the senior professors, the most famous, world-famous professors, sitting down at lunchtime with the maintenance staff, sitting around tables to discuss possibilities for the way the university might go in this direction or that direction. We've got to have that courage to enable those difficult conversations to go forward. Thank you. Um, we have time till 7.30, as far as I understand, and I have uh, 10 questions already in the list. So um, if we uh, invite, uh, I see Jay would like to ask a question, then Kunda, I want to ask a question from there. Um, I'll probably begin with the question which arrived first here, and then uh, we'll also give opportunity to several colleagues in in uh, in the room to to also make a comment to ask a question. So the first question here uh, in my um, on our list is from uh, Mr. Pete Smith, doctoral research and librarian at Sheffield Hallam University. He uh, says, "Thank you, Professor Barnett. Should the university be prepared to be told things it does not like, to be the subject?" and not only the generator of critique as an element of super complexity. And he followed up with another uh, question. I'll probably already kind of ask this question. Professor Bond, you have worked with colleagues from Chile amongst, amongst other places. Turning to a question from Bacevich, what is it that makes a university a university? How do we define its territory, quote unquote, in the UK, in Hong Kong, in Chile? So, shall I have go? Yes, please. Um, well, I just take the second one first. Well, it's in my mind. It follows from what I've been saying that the essence of a university is that nothing is off the table. Um, Everything is potentially on the table. And more than that, oh, it's on the table in such a way that it can open up in all sorts of unknown directions and that the conversation is open-ended enough to go in all sorts of strange directions. It follows from what I've been saying about complexity or, or, and, and super complexity, that there should be no end to the possibilities of of conversation. Um, but it follows that, as I say, that this space of conversation is not just a nice, comfortable conversation, but it is a matter of critical dialogue. The universities are having matters imposed upon them all the time, and that is the part of the environment that they have to live within. So part of the art of being a university is to try to work out the spaces that are available, that uh, and they differ um, across universities, across nations, the spaces that are available in order to live out one's responsibilities and one's possibilities, as I've been uh, talking about them. And that, as I say, those variations are really quite subtle. So within a multi-faculty university, what's available to the Department of Chemistry is not going to be what's available to the Department of Theology. Um, so we've got to be aware that, as I say, a university is a set of spaces 
and bringing all of that together and realizing the possibilities of all these spaces is is not at all easy so we we have the impositions coming at us whether we like it or not we've got to live with them but we've got to see what we can do with them we've got to work out our powers our possibilities as well as identifying our responsibilities just by the way if i can say so in the introduction to my new book i've got a section on the library what is a university library these days in an internet age? And that again is a not only a complex matter, but a super complex matter. Dr. Jay Park. I'm Jay Park from Education University of Hong Kong, this university. <clears throat> so I saw your um, your drawing, hand drawing. Uh, with these uh, eight uh, systems of complexity. And I liked it very much, um, Professor Ronner. It's a nice drawing, uh, very original, very authentic. Uh, somehow it reminded me of, of this kind of, you know, $10 wine that has this graphic, right? Uh, like a spider graphic. So there is a different coordinate. It says uh, sourness, uh, you know, aroma, you know, uh, tact, fruit, fr uh, fruitiness, <laughs> and so on and so forth. So you, you, the different wine presents uh, the quality of their wine, the characteristic of their, their wine by, by drawing a spider web around it. And this technique is also used in coffee business. So, so certain coffee grains, coffee grains, when they sell it, again, aroma, uh, oily flavor, uh, punchiness, you know, <laughs> and so on and so forth, you know, and they define themselves as, as having a unique characteristic as a wine or as a, as a coffee. Now, this idea of administrative people and then leadership of the university, right, that you mentioned, it seems to me that those people who are administrators, they tend to, to try to become outstanding in every domain of complexities. They wanted to be number one research. They wanted to be number one in uh, public projection, in environmental issues. So they run basically different offices in order to report the quality of the university in different aspects. And I think this is a widespread phenomenon. Every university has its own office of sustainability, office of, I don't know, whatever. They try to excel in every domain. What they do not realize is that they lose their identity. So I'll give you a few examples. In Hong Kong, City University, Poly U, and this university as well. We are a specialized university to cater those people who are like full-time workers outside, and then in the afternoon, they could get, go to a, a place to, to get a degree. I guess that the City University of, of, of London or UK is the same. These are, these are universities with a mission, you know, with a special mission in the society to cater their need. But now, <laughs> the administrators of the university want, want to make us all the universities to have same characteristics, excel in research, excel in teaching, excel in community things, and they somehow destroy their own identity. <laughs> they, they sell their soul, do you understand? And I think this is a very big problem. And, and, and as Benjamin Ginsburg, uh, when he wrote the, the, this problem of the all administrative universities, that's the type of thing that he's accusing. He's, I think he's not upset because some administrators or managers are running the university. That is one thing. Another thing is the administrative mentality of people who are sitting here, us, you and me. We, are, we somehow bought this, this ideology, right? So what do you think about this current tendency of world universities yeah. to become yeah. all administrative yeah. and then to excel in every yeah. domain of human ecosystems. Yeah. Well, I, I've got one or two things I might say, but I don't want to hog the conversation here. I think if colleagues, other colleagues would like to respond or have a thought, uh, otherwise I'll just pitch in. But what do we, what do we think amongst us? Any comments from discussants or 
<laughs> these are these are good questions, uh, Jay, and um, uh, good comments. Um, difficult ones, right? And uh, the complexity um, has been increasing in Hong Kong as well as elsewhere in the world, and we we will definitely face that uh, challenge over the uh, next decade or so, undoubtedly. Uh, the questions that uh, Professor Bonnet uh, raised, <laughs> raised uh, are primarily about how we um, position ourselves uh, in terms of choices that we make, in terms of uh, approaches that we uh, create for ourselves, for us all, I guess, and, and for our students. What uh, do we teach? I'm, I mean, I was challenged by the question, do we really need teachers? Yeah, what? I mean, in terms of, I mean, in terms of the slowing process, because in a way, when you say that uh, we don't necessarily need probably to teach, right? We've got to think about it. But um, I mean, just on teaching, um, I was privileged. I was teaching at a largely postgraduate uh, university. And if, well, um, I might say number one in the world for teaching, but, but, um, as I say, I never saw myself as teaching, and it was great joy to me um, to perhaps arrive one minute late one day and find the students were already there, and they were basically running the show and teaching themselves, um, because that's what university should become. Um, we've got highly intelligent people, incredible resources. Um, what are we doing? What are we adding to the party? Very often we're not. We're subtracting from the party. We're diminishing students' energies rather than increasing students' energies. But just on Jay's points about the excellent university, um, many of you will know an extraordinary book by Bill Redding's The University in Ruins, and he's got a whole chapter on excellence, uh, excellence having become now an empty term every university pretty well of the 25,000 in the world you know will have the word excellent in its website and its self-promotion we are an excellent university it's a non it's an it's a in in the formal language it's an empty signifier it signifies nothing um so we've got to get beneath that and i'm trying I think to try and raise, dare I say, modestly, the level of debate a little, um, and trying to uh, draw attention to the, to the, as it were, the to levels and forces that are present in the world, whether we know it or not. And the question then becomes how we're going to address and respond and relate to those forces and 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 systems in the world. Um, so I, I want to get away from this language of excellence. It, it's absolutely meaningless um, and try and get universities to address much bigger issues that I think there are in the world. But I'm going to go away and think about coffee beans and, uh, and wine growing and your new way from here on. Maybe I'll, I'll, I'll follow up on that uh, um, book you mentioned, The University in Ruins. And uh, this is the question from Dr. Robert Lischinski uh, might be uh, beyond what uh, ruins might uh, really um, be conceptualized in Redding's book. But he asked the question, what role do you envision for the university in rebuilding war-torn countries such as Ukraine? I mean, this complexity and super, super complexity, which we discussed uh, earlier, might apply more to the existing university. And I'm taking you probably to the very difficult type of con conceptual development where ruins might mean something very um, specific and uh, tangible. So how would, how would you um, apply this theory of ecological university to war-torn countries like Ukraine, for example? Well, that, that's an extraordinarily important uh, question, which I think any sensitive um, academic should be asking themselves around the world. Um, 
what kind of allegiance, what kind of friendship, as it were, do we extend, can we extend uh, to colleagues in Ukraine and other such war-torn uh, universities? Who is my friend uh, in the world? Who do I feel, em feel empathy for? Um, I, I find it very difficult to, frankly, watch some of the uh, videos and newsreels coming, particularly um, uh, and not only... Uh, uh, and not only where universities have been directly um, in, involved and where, you know, you know, university buildings have been and, and shattered and all, all the rest of it. Um, uh, and uh, I think many of our universities around the world have been involved in, in giving assistance in material ways. Um, so uh, the, the, it comes in in, in a, a really big way as to what, how we see ourselves in the world. And it, it comes back to some of the things I was saying about what, what is the scope, what is the context within which we're working, uh, to what degree do we engage with others around the world, enlist others, speak with others, speak for others. These are really big issues um, that we, we should go on addressing. Um, and as I say, universities are involved, students are involved, have been involved themselves spontaneously in uh, raising resources for Ukrainian universities and so on and so forth. There are all manner of ways in which we can help. Um, uh, journals have been running special issues on Ukraine um, and, uh, and giving space to Ukrainian scholars um, and so on and so forth. Uh, there are numerous ways, uh, scholarships being offered to Ukrainian students and so on and so forth. So all sorts of ways in which we can reach out. Um, uh, I've been interested for a long time in a, uh, a, a charity which has its headquarters in England, which is concerned to uh, give sanctuary to uh, academics fleeing uh, hostile and oppressed situations around the world. And it's something universities have been doing for perhaps up nearly 100 years or, or so, um, opening themselves up to other academics, if, uh, as I say, fleeing difficult situations. W the nice questions arise about friendship, about hospitality, and so on and so forth. So we can engage with these issues, it seems to me, in all sorts of ways. We should be engaged. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have much time left. It's uh, Professor Bonnet will be speaking also in the seminar to, tomorrow. So I, I, for colleagues here, just I, I suggest we uh, use opportunity tomorrow to, to discuss this. And uh, given that we uh, don't have much time, maybe they're just kind of... Uh, I see the questions here in the in the uh, chat. Uh, we will make sure that we will be able to respond them probably in person. Any last uh, um, comment uh, from discussions? I I echoed the sentiment raised by. Jay and responded by Professor Bennett and Professor Anatoly talking about uh, uh, the, the nature of the university today. Um, so like our daily life here right now in Hong Kong has been driven by RAE exercise. <laughs> uh, and it's all about fundings um, received from from, from the government is all about a four star, three star publications. Um, well, so when I'm talking about campus climate, I think I'm talking about the construction of campus climate, not just conducive to the health and the personal goals of our students, and also conducive to the well being. Uh, the self-esteem of staff, faculty working here. Yeah. Yeah, I just um, wanted to share one more thought about like how we make 
and continue the discussion because at the end we need to continue the discussion to find a kind of a reasonable solution to solve problems. And then to do that, kind of trust and mutual respect among stakeholders are the key issue. But in the current climate with this kind of more monitoring or more surveillance, I would say, then how do we make this kind of mutual respect and also trust? More and more people are trying to find alternative way outside the campus for the teaching, for the research, for any other uh, functions that universities were doing before. And how do we recover that kind of trust uh, in the university side, especially people have a very extremely different fundamental views about everything and whatever you say uh, that are against or offense by very different extreme views, uh, seems like they would never make any consensus. They would never make any agreement to solve the problems. In that kind of climate, how do we recover trust and also resilience uh, and patience to listen to each other? That would be my question and also concern to share. If I'm going to uh, say one word, it's about uh, trust, yeah, as Jason has suggested, uh, and confidence of higher education and university. I believe uh, the whole issue of accountability is based on the issue of trust. Uh, and I think the society uh, should have some way um, to trust the university. So uh, university leaders can serve as leader and trust uh, common academics. Um, and who can initiate that kind of dialogue? That is the question I will start thinking about. And I hope, uh, yeah, when we open the dialogue and open uh, communication, uh, we can see the new uh, possibilities, yeah, rather than we are now sort of uh, in an iron cage of uh, competing with one another and guessing uh, what is needed from the society and what is, get, what is needed uh, from the ever-increasing work uh, expectations like RAE research demands. So I think uh, the matter of trust and communication and leadership will be very uh, crucial yeah, for the future well-being and resilience yeah, of, of the university. Thank you. Thank you very much, colleagues. Uh, thank you very much, Professor uh, Barnett, for uh, this illuminating journey toward uh, the, um, this feasible utopia, as you call it, of uh, ecological university. We are learning from you. Your idea in, uh, ideas inspire us to expand our horizons and um, uh, deepen uh, our understanding, as you mentioned, uh, one of our lecture uh, seminars. Uh, and uh, we look forward to reading more of your books and articles uh, in order to continue exploring and questioning and maybe innovating with the uh, uh, various practices um, and um, in order to kind of to make our universities uh, more enlightened institutions and better institutions in the long run. So um, thank you, all of you. Uh, those who are here in this room and those who are online um, to our discussions, participants, and uh, those who ask questions. We also want to express special thanks to um, Professor Kerry Kennedy, uh, Ms. Kit Chen, and Ms. Celia Yi and, and, and their team uh, for contributing to a successful organization of the distinguished uh, lecture series. Thank you and good night everyone.